Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth uh, seminar in our research seminar series. My name is Zbigniew Wasilewski, and I am uh, the Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I am pleased to have with us today Professor Vijay Ganesh. Vijay is an Associate Professor in our department and the Director of the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute. Prior to joining us here in Waterloo in 2012, he was a research scientist at MIT. He completed his PhD at Stanford University in computer science in 2007. Vijay's primary area of research is the theory and practice of SAT SMT solvers aimed at uh, artificial intelligence, software engineering, security, mathematics, and physics. Vijay, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. A quick comment to the audience. If throughout the presentation uh, you have questions, please use Q&A function. Your questions will be presented to the speaker during the question period. Vijay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Big, for the kind invitation and the kind introduction. So let me jump into it. So today I'm going to talk about Boolean SAT solvers. And in fact, uh, the core question in SAT solver research, that is why are SAT solvers so effective? And I'll be presenting this through the lens of combination of deduction, i.e. logic and statistical learning or machine learning. First, let me start by providing you some context and motivation as to why you should care about SAT and SMT solvers. So, and allow me to define the term SAT solver and SMT solver. So the term SAT solver refers to a computer program that takes its input formulas in Boolean logic and decides whether they have solutions or not, whether they are satisfiable or not. If so, it will produce a solution. If there are no solutions, it will say there are no solutions. It will declare that the formula is unsatisfiable. The term SMT refers to satisfiability model of theories, which is essentially referring to satisfiability problem for first order logic theories, theories that are much richer than Boolean logic. And the, it is, in fact, first order logic is the language of pretty much all of mathematics today. So this question of designing such computer programs that can solve Boolean logic formulas or first order logic formulas is in fact the very first question that was posed in computer science back in 1900 when David Hilbert gave a talk at the International Congress of Mathematicians and posed two important questions. The first question was whether first order logic was automatable. He didn't use words like computer science or automatable, but he had the right intuition. And then the 23rd problem that Hilbert posed was whether Diophantine equations were solvable. And 31 years later, his student Gödel showed that this dream cannot be achieved, that uh, mathematics cannot be automated, at least not in full generality, via his incompleteness theorems. And in six, five years later, in 1936, Turing showed that even first order logic was undecidable. So then you might ask the question, what are we doing here today, automating mathematics? i.e. writing computer programs that take us input mathematical formulas and solve them. Put differently, they take us input conjectures in mathematics and try to prove them or disprove them. Well, even though in the limit we cannot solve these problems, these problems are solvable for large fragments of mathematics and they have wonderful applications. Applications including in software engineering such as formal methods, program analysis, automated testing, program synthesis, security, AI, all of these areas rely on SAT and SMT solvers. So why is that? Like, what is a one slide summary of how you can use a SAT SMT solver? So your standard issue static analysis tool or dynamic analysis or symbolic analysis or verification tool uh, takes us input a computer program and a specification and logic, converts the computer program into a logic formula, and then more often than not calls a SAT and SMT solver as a backend. And the way things are set up is that if the solver produces a solution to the problem, that means that there is a bug in the program with respect to the specification. Such a way of designing your system enables better engineering, better usability, better novelty, and separation of concerns. Mm -hmm. So this idea has been around since the very beginning of software engineering as a field. But even though the idea was around, it was only in the last 20 years that SAT SMT solvers took off like a rocket. And why is that? Well. What happened in the last 20 years is that we have made significant algorithmic improvements, so much so that we were able to solve a few thousand constraints in a short amount of time, maybe a minute or two uh, in the late 1990s. Today, we are able to solve 
formulas with millions, hundreds of millions of constraints and variables in them. A consequence of this is that today we are people have developed solver-based programming languages, solver-based type systems, compilers, debuggers, concurrency bug finding systems, synthesis tools. Solvers are finding applications in uh, solving open problems in mathematics, in physics. In all these areas, the, there is a need for modeling systems in mathematics, and then a solver is invoked to then analyze that model. That's basically what's going on. So there has been this massive improvement in the performance of these solvers, and that has enabled all these technologies. So my own contributions in this setting have been as follows. I've developed five different solvers, and my uh, career has tracked a similar trend of uh, increasingly faster and faster algorithms. So uh, I'm going to list my contributions very quickly here. The first solver that I built was STP, which is a solver for a theory of bit vectors and arrays, which was used as a basis for symbolic execution-based testing and analysis. Then I developed two solvers, Humpty and Z3 String. These solvers are aimed at uh, solving formulas over theories of word equations and regular expressions and context-free mm -hmm. grammars aimed at finding bugs in PHP code and JavaScript code, et cetera. And then I also developed another tool called MathCheck, which is a combination of a Boolean SAT solver and a computer algebra system. And the goal of this tool is to find counterexamples to mathematical conjectures automatically, just as a Boolean SAT solver is used to find bugs in code. And using this, we have solved or resolved many open problems, found counterexamples to them, especially in the context of combinatorics, which are particularly, um, can be attacked particularly effectively using uh, computational tools. <laughs> and finally, uh, the most of my talk will be focused on the MapleSat Boolean SAT solver, which is a SAT solver for Boolean logic, and it's been widely used and adopted in uh, industry and academia. And it has won several medals at the highly competitive uh, international SAT competition. I've also worked in other areas such as attack resistance, complexity of SAT and SMT solvers, decidability and complexity of first order theories, et cetera. But the core focus of my talk today will be MapleSat. So what are the research questions? The central question in solver research is why are SAT solvers efficient? Allow me to unpack this question for you. In 1971, Stephen Cook proved that Boolean SAT problem is NP complete. Recall that the Boolean SAT problem is given formulas in Boolean logic in conjunctive normal form, decide whether they have they are satisfiable. By satisfiable, we mean whether they have solutions. And this problem was shown to be NP complete, and it is believed to be intractable in general. That that is that, in the worst case, even the best algorithm will take exponential time to solve uh, Boolean SAT. Uh, instances. But we have developed these very efficient solvers in practice that can solve formulas with hundreds of millions of variables in them in a few minutes. So there seems to be a gap between theory and practice. The theory, the map, is not aligning with the territory, the practice. Mm. And we need to fill this gap somehow. We need to bridge this gap. So can we bridge this gap and in a way that not only deepens our theoretical understanding, but acts as a basis for better solver design going forward. And <clears throat> another way to think about this is that solvers were originally designed for applications in hardware verification, but now they're being used in all these other settings and they're working really, really well. So the glove is fitting the hand very well, even when you keep changing the hand. On the other hand, we do know of crafted classes of instances. By crafted, I mean that specifically designed to make the solver run for a long time for which the solver behaves poorly and meaning that it takes exponential time. And so we wanna be able to understand that too. These include instances such as cryptographic instances that, that are designed to be hard to analyze. And many of these questions have been open for close to 25 years now. So, and this question is not limited to SAT solvers but limited to any mathematical reasoning method that has been developed in recent years uh, and which is very surprising because these problems range from NP complete to P space complete to NX time complete to undecidable. And yet we are able to come up with very efficient algorithm for not all prop, all instances, but many instances that are relevant in practice. 
And Richard Karp, who's a Turing Award winner and many other uh, Turing Award winners have said that this gap between theory and practice is the most fundamental question in complexity theory and computer science today. So let's break these questions down further, why solvers are efficient. So the first uh, step here is that we want to be able to model the solver in some way so that we can, so that it's analyzable. And further, we want to have an associated scientific design principle that will allow us to build better solvers. So which would allow us to have a deeper understanding of practical solvers and then use that deeper understanding to build better solvers going forward. The second aspect of this question is not only do we want this mathematical abstraction, but then we want to be have kind of sets of parameters that allow us to prove parameterized complexity theory like upper and lower bounds. So here I'm taking a view that parameterized approach to understanding the complexity of these methods is the right way of understanding, a, a right way of bridging the gap between theory and practice. Uh, and the traditional way in which complexity theorists have approached their field is through worst case analysis, uh, worst case complexity. And here I'm advocating that we need to go beyond worst case. And there is in fact a subfield of complexity theory called parameterized complexity theory, which is the right fit for this kind of uh, analysis. So we want to have a parameterized understanding of easy industrial instances, but also the parameter should be able to distinguish between so-called easy industrial instances from random and crafted instances that we know to be hard for SAT solvers. And at the end of the day, we want to be able to prove these complexity theoretic results over the uh, an, uh, appropriate mathematical abstraction of the solving alg algorithm. So here are my core contributions. My very first contribution was to try to answer this question of what constitutes a powerful solver abstraction that is useful both in theory and practice. It turns out that theor theorists have been thinking about proof systems for a long time. Proof systems are just collection of rules, uh, the goal being to automate mathematics. So they want to automate mathematics. So they say, well, how do the mathematicians do their job? What kind of rules do they use to construct proofs? And then they build these proof systems and then they study their complexity. So this has been going on for a long time. On the other hand, solver developers were developing their methods. And it turns out that solver developers were actually using these proof rules to develop their methods. So there is this natural connection there. But my main contribution was the realization that a proof system is simply a bag of rules. It's not an algorithm. When you want to put it on a computer, you want to algorithmize it somehow. And the process of algorithmizing it means that you have to figure out how to sequence these rules, how to realize when to apply which rule. So this essentially boils down to an optimization problem of sequencing, selecting, and initializing proof rules. Put it, put it differently, a SAT solver is a decision procedure that takes us input a formula and says whether or not the formula is satisfiable. But if you were to open up the SAT solver, what you realize is that it's actually an optimization procedure that's trying to construct the optimal proof for the given input. And <clears throat> this, uh, view actually works well for both sat and satisfiable and unsatisfiable instances because solvers produce proofs of unsatisfiability for unsatisfiable instances, obviously, but even for satisfiable instances, they construct proofs for parts of the search space that are empty. This idea that a sat solver is a combination of proof rules and machine learning methods aimed at optimally sequencing, selecting, and initializing proof rule is the core contribution that I made in the maple sat salt solver, which has then been adopted and adapted by many other researchers. And this has led to the award-winning maple sat solver. And since then we have developed five different uh, machine learning based branching heuristics. Uh, in the future, an ongoing work is to extend this to other kinds of solver methods like extended resolution, inf interference based proof systems, SMT solvers, et cetera. Now, the second part of the question that I raised previously was, can we get a parameterized understanding of practical formulas that are different from random formulas? Uh, and here, uh, this idea of why parameterized complexity is so relevant has been understood by complexity theorists uh, for a long time, relevant in bridging the gap between theory and practice. And we leverage ideas from this setting. And we have done extensive work in understanding the structure of real world instances and how they differ from randomized instances or specifically crafted instances. And we, we have proposed candidate parameters uh, that are both practically meaningful, but also 
amenable to theoretical analysis. In addition, I have also shown polynomial equivalence between solvers and specific kind of resolution proof systems like merge resolution that were inspired by uh, these parameters that we observe in practice. And the final contribution that I might touch upon towards the end of my talk is as follows. So in the core contribution, I talk about how I can leverage machine learning to help solvers or how I can leverage machine, learnings, machine learning to help logic. Can I go the other way? Can I use logic to help machine learning? And as you are well aware, machine learning systems today are ubiquitous and we use them in all kinds of settings. But the problem with machine learning systems is that while they are very good at, uh, in terms of accuracy, they are bad in terms of security, reliability, robustness, interpretability, and explainability. And this is where logic comes into play because you can use logic to specify properties of machine learning systems and say, I don't want my machine learning system to be um, amenable to adversarial attacks or some other kind of attack. I want my machine learning system to adhere to this particular specification and so on. So in this context, I've developed a variety of methods called one of them is logic guided machine learning. Another one is constraint gradient descent algorithm uh, for testing DNNs and so on. Uh, time permitting, I will touch upon this as well. All right, so now that we have <clears throat> most of the context, motivation, and my contribution in a nutshell, let me jump into the Boolean satisfiability problem. So the problem briefly is you're given formulas in conjunctive normal form. Every, uh, by conjunctive normal form, we mean that we have a conjunction of clauses. Each clause is a disjunction of literals and every literal is a variable or its negation. And the goal is to decide the satisfiability of these problems. And the problem is known to be NP-complete and believed to be intractable in general. And SAT solvers are required to prove proofs of unsatisfiability for unsat instances and satisfying assignment for SAT instances. All right, so quick overview of the modern SAT solver. It takes as input a Boolean formula. Step one, it performs propagation, meaning that it simplifies a formula with respect to certain rules. So one of the rules that it uses is, suppose you have a, a clause in your formula, which has exactly one literal in it, let's say X then you know that you have to set X to true if your goal is to determine its satisfiability. It's possible that the propagator might come back and say the formula is sat or unsat, but typically it would say, I don't know, because it's a limited form of a solver. If the uh, propagator comes back and says that the, uh, is the formula is either unknown, we doesn't know whether it is satisfiable or, uh, or it is satisfiable, then uh, we actually make a check called conflict. By conflict, what we mean is that whether or not the formula is unsatisfiable under the current partial assignment. If not, then we check whether all the variables have been assigned. If yes, we return sat. If not, we choose a variable, add it to the list of unit uh, clauses it has, and we propagate it. I will define the term unit in a minute, but it essentially means that uh, a clause, the variable has to be set in a particular way. And then, <clears throat> you propagate, keep propagating it until such time that the formula becomes unsatisfiable under the current partial assignment, at which point you trigger conflict analysis to figure out why the formula is unsatisfying under the current partial assignment. And you keep doing that until you converge to the correct answer. So the best way to see this is through the lens of an assignment tree. So you have an assignment tree where there is a variable X at the root of the tree, and that variable is a decision variable. I mean, you chose to assign it the value false, and you propagate it all the way until uh, you hit a, a red node here that denotes that that particular path was conflicting, meaning unsatisfying for the formula. And at which point it triggers the conflict analysis. Now, what is conflict analysis? The idea is very simple. In life, you make choices, which is like decisions, right? You make decisions. And when you make those decisions, it is possible that you realize after some time that you made the wrong choice because things are not working. So what do you do? You you say, I'm not going to make that set of choices in the game. And that's what's going on. So you learn a clause, you realize that if you were to set X to false, you would always hit this unsatisfying assignment. So you learn a clause saying, never set X to false. That's the lesson learned. Now in life, you cannot do backtracking, but on a, in a computer you can. So the solver backtracks and tries the other direction and keeps doing that, learns another lesson and so on. So what is the solver doing? Solver is making choices and learning lessons, deductive lessons about the search space of the formula and remembering them so that it doesn't make the same mistakes again. And every time it learns a lesson, it cuts the search dramatically. That's exactly what we do in life as well as we learn lessons. So 
Uh, so applying these ideas, uh, going back to this slide, what I focused on in my research was the branching heuristic, because here, it, this is where machine learning comes into play and conflict analysis is where logical reasoning comes into play. So a branching heuristic is very important, just like in life, making right, correct choices is so important. The same thing is true in solvers. You wanna make choices in the appropriate way as soon as possible. And prior to my work, when if you were to ask people, what is a branching heuristic? A branching heuristic, they would say is just, it takes, chooses a variable from the set of all variables and assigns it some value. But what I realized was there is more to it. And we studied a lot of branching heuristic to better understand this. So allow me to explain our deeper understanding of the branching heuristic and the whole SAT solver setup from a different angle. And this is the angle of reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, what you have, are you have agents that are, uh, uh, interacting with environments and learning through that, learning through that interaction. So in this setting, what we have is a decision heuristic, a branching heuristic that chooses variable. It's like a student that is trying to solve a problem. It's the agent. And it's just going on and setting variables to various values. When it gets stuck with a partial assignment that is not satisfying for the formula, it goes to a teacher, which is in this case, a deductive system, a clause learning system. And the teacher in a Zen-like position would say, this is why the partial assignment is not working. So it gives a pithy reason as to why the partial assignment doesn't work. And exponentially many similar assignments also will not work. And it feeds that back as a learned clause in the, in the assignment tree that I showed you, that learned clause, the first learned clause was the assigning the variable X to true. And the student remembers that. And then it learns from it which variable to choose next and keeps doing that until it converges. So now the question was, what do we focus the student's energy on? Meaning, what is the objective function that we want to optimize here? And we realize that the objective function that is best to optimize in this setting is what we refer to as global learning rate. What do we mean by that? Global learning rate means is the, is the ratio of the number of conflicts to the number of decisions. Every time you hit a conflict, you're actually learning something about the search space. So this is actually quite counterintuitive. You would have thought that the way I want to branch is so that I can get to the satisfying assignment quickly. But what I'm saying is, no, the best way to learn is making a mistake so that you hit a conflict as soon as possible. And the sooner you hit a conflict, you learn a clause. And further, the kind of conflicts you want to learn are ones with fewest number of assumptions. It's just like in life. You want to come to deductions with fewest number of assumptions possible, ideally no assumptions. Right? So in the same way, you learn these conflicts which are correspond to lemmas about the search space of the formula and decisions that are the <clears throat> number of case splits that you do. And you want to maximize this objective. And with this idea in mind, now let's look at an algorithm that would solve this problem. So in order to explain the algorithm, I have to do a little bit of setup. I'm going to talk about an algorithm that is very popular in reinforcement learning aimed at solving a problem called a multi bandit problem. So what is the problem? So the problem is this, imagine that you're a gambler, you go into a casino, you have 1 million slot machines. Now your goal is to maximize your return for the given amount of resources you have. Well, so what are you going to do? You're going to play some slot machines. One approach could be play some random slot machines. That's not going to work very well. You can try playing all the slot machines to see which one is best. But if there are million slot machines, that also is not optimal. So you're going to choose some slot machines and then you're going to play. And the point is that you might choose the one that is giving you the maximum return and just keep pulling the arm. But the problem is that this strategy will not work if the returns from that slot machine changes over time. Perhaps the slot machine was giving you a lot of reward at the beginning to rope you in, but then eventually the rewards start going down. So you want to move to a different slot machine at that point. So sample average of the returns from a slot machine is probably not the best idea. So what you want to do is what we refer to as an exponential moving average, meaning that you want to bias towards those slot machines that are trending better, that are going in a right direction, that are giving you more returns, right? And even though one slot machine was very productive for you back in the day, but if it's not productive, you somehow want to decay it away. And you can do this using exponential moving average. In fact, people use this in stock uh, markets to see the trend of which stock will give me more returns in the near future based on the behavior of the stock in the near past. That's what we're doing here. So uh, by weighting the uh, returns way back in time, 
giving it less and less and less weight, it zeroes out those returns and you get um, give more weight to the latest returns. So uh, this way you can get the best uh, approach. It's actually computationally very cheap and very effective method. So what's the connection with SAT solvent? Well, what we do is we take uh, uh, the MAB problem and apply it to the branching problem. So in this analogy, every slot machine corresponds to a Boolean variable. And with every Boolean variable in the formula, input formula, we uh, associate a time series, time series between reward and time that tells us whether the rewards are trending up or down. What is the reward here? Reward is a number of conflicts that variable gave me. What does that mean? If I branch on the variable, if it immediately gives me a conflict, I'm very happy because it gives me a lemma to log. And if I keep branching on it on a small subset of variables, it gives me a lot of conflicts, but eventually, these variables will stop giving me conflicts because there are only so many conflicts to learn and I will move on to other more richer pastures. And this is the core idea behind our branching method. So let's get into it. So here is uh, the example where you have a student that tells the teacher, here is a partial assignment that's not working and the teacher feeds back a learn clause. In this case, there are three assignments in which the variable A appeared, meaning that this variable is very productive for me because it's giving me a loan clause. And in two of them, it appeared in the loan clause. So it's, it's actually a really productive uh, variable to branch on. By contrast, here is a variable B, which appeared in the conflict a partial assignment, but does not appear in any loan clause. So this variable is not very productive for me. So I keep track of this. So here is a time series. Every dot here is a, a conflict. And the clauses written on top or bottom are the conflict clauses that I learned. So I assign variable A at some point and I unassign at some other point and I track how many times it appears in conflict clauses or in the conflict graph. And I keep doing that to get my time series. And so I get sample learning rate A equal to two by three, sample learning rate A equal to one by three subsequently. And I decay away the earlier rewards and always give a highest weight to the latest rewards. And then what do I do? I rank the, the variables based on the rewards I get, just like I would rank slot machines. So this has some similarity to previous method called VSIS, but there are significant differences that make our method much more efficient. So once we came up with this method, we implemented this method, you know, as you know, SAT solvers are pretty complicated objects and we were able to implement our method with just 50 lines of code or so on. Or, or so on. And we took the uh, SAT instances from the SAT competition, which is a highly competitive setting. And we compared our method apple to apple using a mini, the mini SAT SAT solver, which was using the previous method called VSIS. So here is a cactus plot, and this is what we live or die by. And on the x-axis, you have the number of solved instances. On the y-axis, you have time. And the way to read this plot is that if you look at the point 1,000, 1,000, that's the point. If a solver goes through, uh, the a graph goes through that point, it means that that solver is able to solve 1,000 instances with at most 1,000 seconds timeout per instance. So therefore you wanna be as much to the right of this graph and as low as possible. And as you can see, the LRB method is uh, to rightmost and the lower, the most lower in this graph compared to the best other methods. And uh, we were able to solve 100 instances in the first try. Uh, whereas typically, you know, if a solver can solve one more instance as instant than the previous winning solver, we pat ourselves on the back and uh, declare victory. So here we were able to solve 100 more instances. And this led us, MapleSat, our solver, to win the SAT competition in 2016 and uh, medal in 2017. And since then, all solvers that medal use MapleSat as, a, as, a, as their basic solver. And we also cross-verified that the solver that maximizes the global learning rate also is the best in terms of performance. So LRB is the best, followed by NVSIDs, CHB, and other branching heuristics. So in summary, what we did was we used a machine learning method as in to solve an optimization problem. What was the optimization problem? How best to sequence variable selection, which corresponds to application of unit resolution rule. And uh, we did this by identifying an objective function called the global learning rate and then optimizing it. And this kind of an approach is really, really good for, it's a highly localized strategy that's very well suited for industrial instances. And since then we have developed a variety of other machine learning based heuristic like splitting heuristics for parallel SAT solvers, restart policies for SAT solvers, initialization heuristics, 
algorithm selection, tactic selection, and on and on. And it is like a mini industry now of applying machine learning to uh, SAT and SMT solvers, and also first order and higher order theorem provers. So the second contribution is, how do we get a deeper understanding? How do we get to a point where we answer Richard Karp's call of bridging the gap between theory and practice? And to do this, we need to identify parameters that work, that not only speak to practice, but are amenable to, in theory as well. So to kind of pare down the questions here, um, what would be a proof system that would characterize CDCL solver exactly or in a very tight way? And people have talk, talked about, thought about this. I, they've shown polynomial equivalence between resolution and the solver that I showed you, conflict-driven class learning SAT solvers. And we did more than that. We showed a, a polynomial equivalence between merge resolution and CDCO, but also identifying these parameters is very, very important. So that's the question two here. So how do we go about doing this? So the, we need to make sure that the parameters that we identify that, uh, uh, that characterize the structure of Boolean formulas um, must be such that they must be able to distinguish between random formulas and uh, crafted formulas on the one hand and structured formulas like crypto and verification formulas on the other. And further, the parameters must correlate well with solver running time, right? So if you take a Boolean formula, it's like a graph. It's a very complicated structure and it has a lot of information in it. You can parameterize it in a variety of different ways, but the meaningful parameters are the ones that correlate well with solver running time because that's when we know the parameter matters in explaining why the solver works well. So in this setting, uh, theorists have proposed a variety of parameters, parameters such as backdoor, for example, or tree width. So the idea behind tree width is you take the graph of a Boolean formula, and then you say, how close is it, is it to a tree? Is it, the closer it is to a tree, the hypothesis is, the conjecture is that the easier the formula would be. Unfortunately, the proposals made by the theorists, when they come in contact with reality, they shatter. By that, I mean that these proposals don't explain reality. So in particular for tree width, we can show formulas that have very small tree width and yet are very difficult to solve. On the other hand, there are formulas with very large tree width and very easy to solve. So clearly tree width alone is not an explanation for why solvers are efficient. Another, uh, on the other hand, empiricists have proposed uh, structures like community structure, for example, uh, meaning that you take the graph of a formula and you cluster the parts of the formula in a way that there are more edges inside each cluster and fewer edges going to the rest of the formula. And they've shown that indeed community structure of a formula correlates well with solver runtime. But the trouble is, with community structure is that it's not amenable to theoretical analysis, at least not easily. So we need a parameter that is both explaining the phenomena that we are observing in reality, just like a physicist would look at a physical uh, phenomena and try to explain what's going on. We are looking at this algorithm and it's so complicated, we can't understand everything. Even though humans designed it, we don't understand how it works, why it works so well. <clears throat> so we want to be able to capture the parameters that explain what's going on in reality through experiments, but then we can also prove uh, upper and parameterize upper and lower bounds. So um, it, within this setting, uh, people have proposed a variety of different uh, parameters. I'm going to focus on one particular parameters that I came up with, parameter that I came up with, but I'm also working on a couple of others. And I think we are much closer to this, uh, answering the call of complexity theorists, uh, namely uh, explain why practical algorithms work so well. So I would focus on a particular proof rule called merge resolution. So what is merge resolution? Well, think of uh, transitivity of implication. So imagine that I give you two formulas, A implies B and B implies C. Then you know that A implies C, right? We know this transitivity of implication. Now, this can be generalized to a method, a proof rule called resolution. So in resolution, you are given two clauses x1 all the way up to xn, and the second clause is negation of xn, y1, et cetera, ym. And here is the resolution. And you can derive, you can cancel xn and negation of xn out because that's where the implication happens. The first clause is implying xn, the second clause has xn as the antecedent of the implication. And you can say xn, et cetera, up to xn minus one, y1, et cetera, up to ym. 
you can derive that clause. But now imagine the following. Imagine that most of the literals other than the, this XN literal, which is called the pivot literal, are overlapping. They are the same. Then what you get is the resultant clause is going to be shorter than both the input clauses. So I can illustrate this using this example here. This is a proof, uh, proof in resolution. And here, what you notice is that we derive at this, where my cursor is, you derive the unit clause X sub i, and it happens precisely when you have two clauses that share X sub i. And here on the, on the other side, you have negation of X sub i, you have two clauses that share negation of X sub i completely. So whenever you have this overlap between clauses, you get shorter and shorter clauses. And that seems to be crucial because at the end of the day, in order to complete a proof, you need to derive shorter and shorter clauses. So we call this property mergeability, meaning how much overlap is there between the clauses of an input formula. So what we did, we did a control experiment. We constructed pseudo industrial instances with a set of variables, about 400 or so variables. And we uh, counted how many of these clauses that are resolvable have opposing literals in them have overlaps as well. And if they have overlaps, meaning that means that they are what we refer to as highly mergy, mergy clauses. And we uh, count this uh, over the set of formulas that we constructed, and we are able to tune this merge parameter up and down, meaning that we can make the formula highly mergy at one end of the spectrum and very low mergy at the other end. So the mean here is zero on the x-axis, and we are able at eight would be like highly mergy and minus nine would be very low mergy. And what we are witnessing here on the y-axis is the average loan clause size. As the formula gets more and more mergy, as there are more and more overlap, we get smaller and smaller loan clauses, which is great because the smaller the loan clause, the more the search space that I cut. And we further noticed that there is a very strong correlation even with the solving run, solving time and the uh, merginess of the formula. It's not so strong in the case of satisfiable formulas, but it is very strong in the case of unsatisfiable formulas. So this tells us that this parameter is worthy of further research and theoretical analysis. So in summary, in the, the proof complexity part of my work, what I've done is I've shown that CDCL solvers are polynomially equivalent to merge resolution. Also, we've shown that uh, first UIP is a particular heuristic we use in solvers. It requires a merge. We have also proved several results for with and without restarts. I'm not going to go in deep into that, but the most important part is that the merge parameter also seems to be quite relevant in practice. And this is not the only parameter that we have focused on. We have also focused on more recently on another parameter called hierarchical community structure. The paper on that got accepted just last week. And we think the hierarchical community structure is idea is very very intuitive. It's just, you know, if you take any human design system, it tends to be hierarchical and modular, uh, human written code or human written hardware. And these formulas are actually obtained from human design systems. So these formulas tend to be, have hierarchies in them. And every hierarchy seems to be highly modular, which is the community structure. So we define this structure called hierarchical community structure. And we show that when formulas have good hierarchical community structure, these formulas are easy to solve whereas the ones with bad hierarchical community structure are hard to solve. So a combination of these parameters is what I believe will eventually help us prove the parameters upper and lower bound. The final contribution I wanna talk about here is how we can use logic to guide machine learning. And I'm gonna give you a very simple example here, but this is a very powerful idea with long-term consequences. So here is the idea. I want to learn the Pythagorean theorem just from data, okay? So I don't want to go to a mathematician. I just want to give it to a machine learning model that will just output the equation for the Pythagorean theorem. So I give input uh, of the sides of the, these inputs have three values in them, A, B, C, that are the lengths of the sides of right angle triangles. I give that as an input to a machine learning model. These are called symbolic regression models that output an equation. And it turns out that tradition, people have researched symbolic regression for a long time. They, output equation typically tends to overfit the data. So if the data is, has some noise in it, it will not be good. So what we then do is we take the symbolic representation thus obtained, we give it to a SAT solver, and now we do which every student does when they're listening to a lecture. What every student does when they're listening to a lecture is they cross-check the information they're getting with what they know to be true already. This is the cross-verification process. Physicists do all this all the time. If your theory is inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics, then if there is something wrong with your theory. In the same way, we take the symbolic representation of the machine learning model, we give it to the SAT solver, 
and we give it an auxiliary truth. In this case, the auxiliary truth that we know to be relevant is the triangle inequality, which says that the sum of the lengths of two sides of a triangle must be greater than the length of the third side. And if there is a inconsistency between these two, then I know that your symbolic model, symbolic representation of your model is broken. Your machine learning model is broken. I construct a counter example and ask the machine learning model to go and learn again. And using this, we were able to learn many functions using Pythagorean theorem and sine function. So we are on this charge where we are bringing logic in different ways to machine learning. So conclusions and takeaway, in brief, we can view SAT solvers as combination of deductive reasoning, just like a mathematician proof system and machine learning that enables us to optimally sequence, select and initialize these proof rules. And this idea has been used to construct many solvers, including the Maple Sat solver. In the second research question is, how do we address the gap between theory and practice? For this, we need the appropriate parameters that work well both in theory and practice. And here we have proposed two parameters. I talked about one merge, but also we have found another one, hierarchical community structure. And we believe it's the combination of these two that will get us to the promised land. And finally, combining machine learning and logic, we can go the other way where we use logic to improve machine learning systems. And that's uh, another direction of research that I'm working on. So there's a lot of future work uh, lined up. A lot of it has to do with very strong proof systems that theorists have been studying for many years and practitioners still don't know how to implement them properly. And so we are working on that. And again, we are planning, we are actually using machine learning to do that. We are also working on uh, methods to improve the reliability, robustness, and security of AI systems via logic, for example, one example is the constraint gradient descent algorithm. Another direction of my future work is in applying solvers to cryptanalysis. So we have come up with the tool uh, for detecting algebraic fault attacks in uh, certain uh, hash functions and so on. And we're working on also extending it to different kinds of cryptanalysis like differential cryptanalysis and so on. And I've also worked in the context of proof complexity uh, beyond SAT solvers, for example, in the context of SMT solvers and MC SAT solvers. So I'm going to skip over this contributions. And at this point, uh, I will conclude by saying that the kind of the gist of the talk here is the future belongs to combinations of machine learning and deduction or logic. And machine learning can play a big role in improving solvers. Conversely, logic can play a huge role in improving machine learning. In fact, there is a whole field dedicated to this called neurosymbolic AI. That's one field where people are using logic to improve machine learning, but also uh, other field called testing analysis, verification, and security of machine learning system. And these two fields are relatively new and are going to have huge impact going forward. With that, I'll end my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vijay, for this uh, insightful presentation. I'm sure there will be quite a few questions. Uh, so the, the floor is open for questions. Uh, all right, so so let me take advantage of this spot here, and uh, um, you 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 mentioned a few times uh, physics and problems there, and uh, I wonder whether there is already a lot of uh, activities in constructing set solvers for physical problems, and kind of first part of the question, and the, the second. Uh, do you see uh, down the road, uh, if uh, more work is going to be put on, onto those solvers, that uh, uh, theoretical physicists will be out of the job? Um, okay, because <laughs> you know it, it, it does look like uh, the machine can beat uh, in thinking even the humans. So taking the first question, can solvers be applied to solve problems in physics? Uh, yes, so there are many problems in physics that are NP-complete or can be reduced to solving a satisfiability problem. So one example is the Cochin-Specker theorem. There is a theorem in quantum mechanics that says that it's a Cochin-Specker theorem that essentially talks about what is the state of the spin of electrons before you measure it? Do they even have a spin? Uh, and this theorem suggests that they don't, and it's only when you measure it, you get the spin, which is a mind-blowing result, which kind of suggests that it's the measurement that causes an event to happen. It's not like the, the object has that property to begin with, it's a measurement that causes the property. And that's, that's an interpretation of the theorem. Anyway, so it turns out that there is an open problem as to what's the minimum vector system for which the, this result holds, 
And this can be reduced to a graph coloring problem, which is an NP-complete problem, which can then be solved using a SAT solver. With regard to your second question, whether theoretical physicists will be out of a job, I don't think so. Not at least, you know, in the near future. Having said that, machine learning as well as solvers are making inroads in theoretical physics. So for example, uh, recently, uh, think of it this way, a typical physicist, when they complete their PhD, as they're completing their PhD, if, if their work is primarily theoretical, often they do simulations, right? So they write simulation code, which is a very difficult thing to do. And one way to lower the difficulty of that is to use machine learning models that can be highly predictive. So people have proposed a lot of machine learning models to solve partial differential equations or to replace simulations. And in that way, they make the work of the physicists much, much easier. But also in the, in the talk, I presented a, an application of going from data to prediction or scientific discovery of laws. And I have been working with people at the Perimeter Institute to come up with machine learning systems that can predict certain uh, phenomena from data. So in that sense, machine learning models are augmenting the theoretical physicist. And of course, at the end of the day, you still have to do that cross check, meaning that you, you can predict anything you want, but at the end of the day, it has to be consistent with what you know to be true. And that's where the theoretical physicist comes into play to check the, check the result of the machine learning model. So to answer your question, I think machine learning models and uh, logical tools like SAT solvers, SMT solvers, computer algebra systems, will continue to be used heavily and even more so going forward to augment the, uh, to prune away bad ideas and rule in some good ideas, which can then be checked experimentally. So yes, the, the use of these tools is only going to increase over time. One other related question with this uh, outstanding 1 million question in P versus uh, NP, yeah. uh, what, uh, what, what's your thought about that? Are you going for this award? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. And it's been the P versus NP question for those who are not aware. The central question there is, can Boolean satisfiability be solved in polynomial time? Okay. A polynomial in the number of variables in the input formula. And nobody believes that, or at least no person that I know of who works in computers, theoretical computer science, uh, believes that to be true. That is, Everybody believes that any algorithm you come up with to solve the Boolean satisfiability problem, that algorithm will take, in the worst case, exponential time to solve certain formulas, even though they might be able to solve certain other formulas efficiently. But the difficulty with the P versus NP question is that you have to show that for all the infinitely many algorithms out there that can be used to solve the Boolean sat problem, every one of them will fail on some class of instances. So it's like a lower bound and proving lower bounds is an extremely difficult thing. So that's why this question, the P versus NP question has remained open for more than 50 years now. And what do I believe? I believe that P is not equal to NP, meaning that no matter what method you come up with, in the worst case, your method will take exponential time. Many people have proposed proofs of P not equal to NP, and they submit these proofs to the to the conference that I go to, usually the SAT conference or Stock or Fox. And the theorists know that the, our state of understanding is so weak at this point that all these proofs are broken in some way or the other. So they don't even often don't read it. Um, but uh, many many people are trying to prove this because it's so seductive to to approach this question. If you are into theoretical computer science or mathematics a lot of people get interested in this problem. And so, yeah, I'm not gonna to try to attempt to solve this problem, but yeah. yeah so yeah, it kind of reminds me of the of the second law of thermodynamics uh, where the, there's, there's always uh, somebody trying to show that, uh, yeah, I managed to beat that. It, uh, it, it appears to me that uh, what's happening really with the SAT uh, SMTs uh, is that uh, you, you don't run away from the exponential kind of, uh, law uh, with right. the uh, um, with the NP complete uh, set there uh, of questions you of problems you you just shift it exact that's exactly that's a great observation and you nailed it on the head so even though in the worst case you know we don't expect these problems to be solved efficiently but for many many practical settings as I showed earlier we can actually solve 
large classes of instances very efficiently. So at some level, this problem is of great intellectual interest. It has many wonderful consequences. So if you if somebody were to show P is equal to NP, then that, that would have amazing consequences in cryptography because that would mean that you could solve the factoring problem in polynomial time, which would render all of our security moot, right? So from a practical perspective, the value of investigating the P versus NP question is as follows. In the process of investigating this question, what theorists end up doing is they end up proposing new proof systems, which are stronger and stronger than they have proposed previously, the ones for which they already prove lower bounds. And then they say, look, here is another proof system. Can you prove a lower bound for it? And the value from a practical point of view is that we can leverage that proof system and implement it and automate larger fragments of mathematics as a consequence, and then use that to impact practical applications, whether it be in software engineering, security, AI, physics, or mathematics. So I think that is the, it's not a direct uh, benefit, but it's this indirect benefit of exploring this intellectual question uh, yields proof systems, which then impact practical application over time. So, I, you know, I think that uh, um, it, it, with that, you know, the, the, the presentation, of course, is going to be available soon on the website. So it's all recorded. And I'm sure you will be getting emails uh, with yeah. questions. It, it does take a bit of time to to for this to sink in. Please do connect with me offline, you know, if you're interested either in developing solvers or applying solvers to your research, if you're working broadly in software engineering, security, or AI or even in physics or, or combinatorial mathematics, uh, any of these fields. So, you know, don't be shy, just connect with me, even if this may be a, a new topic to you. Okay. But in any event, thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Vijay, for, for a great talk. And uh, I personally learned a few things and, and got interested to the degree that I will follow up on some of that myself. And, and so maybe you will, you will see emails from me. So thank, uh, you. thank you everybody for, for attending. Uh, uh, Andrea, thank you very much for, for the support uh, uh, of our action here. And next seminar from the series um, um, will be for Stephen Smith uh, about a month from now. Um, and well, you know, have a great long weekend, everybody, uh, after hard work on Friday, of course.